Notice and comment rulemaking can be a demanding process for an agency. This is especially so given the expansive reading of Section 553 requirements that we have seen in cases like Nova Scotia Food, Portland Cement, and Chocolate Manufacturers Association v. Block. Vermont Yankee discourages courts from adding anything to what Section 553 requires. Even so, a notice of proposed rulemaking can be a flashpoint that excites opposition to what the agency thinks best. We have already encountered the exception from Section 553 for matters pertaining to benefits and contracts, and more generally, where the agency can show good cause why the public interest is better served by the immediate issuance of a final rule. Now we explore another exception that is the focus of the opinion in National Family Planning v. Sullivan, a D.C. Circuit decision. The case involves a challenge to a change in the so-called gag rule that restricts what federally subsidized clinics can do and say about abortion. You might assume that because an indigent woman has a constitutional right to elect to terminate an early pregnancy, that she can get the help she needs at any family planning clinic. You would be wrong. Congress, in Title X of the Public Health Service Act, forbids federal funds to be used to support abortion clinics. None of the funds appropriated under the subchapter shall be used in programs where abortion is a method of family planning. This language could be interpreted simply to mean that clinics that perform abortions are not eligible to receive federal funding under Title X. But a Secretary of Health and Human Services read it differently. In 1988, DHHS promulgated the gag rule, which meant that if a project personnel even mentioned abortion, it could lose its federal funding. Title X projects may not provide counseling concerning or provide referral for abortion as a method of family planning. The gag rule was challenged, and in 1991 the gag rule was upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court in the case of Russ v. Sullivan under Chevron Step 2. The court wrote, We need not dwell on the plain language of the statute because we agree that the language is ambiguous. The language that none of the funds appropriated under the subchapter shall be used in programs where abortion is a method of family planning, does not speak directly to the issues of counseling, referral, advocacy, or program integrity. If a statute is silent or ambiguous with respect to the specific issue, the question for the court is whether the agency's answer is based on a permissible construction of the statute. The administration of incoming President George H.W. Bush was uneasy with the gag rule, however. And in 1991, the Secretary directed administrators not to apply the gag rule to prevent women from receiving abortion information from a physician. That is the agency action on which we will focus, the 1991 partial relaxation of the gag rule. Doctors in a Title X program could refer patients to abortion clinics, but nurses and other health care practitioners could not. Recall National Cable versus Brand X Internet. An agency whose interpretation is upheld at Chevron Step 2 remains free to adopt a different interpretation of the statute. The 1991 revision of the gag rule was not promulgated by notice and comment procedures. This was one of the grounds on which it was challenged by national family planning. The agency responded that the relaxed gag rule was accepted from notice and comment by the terms of Section 553 itself. This section does not apply to interpretive rules, general statements of policy, or rules of agency, organization, procedure, or practice. Bear in mind that the agency action challenged here is not the 1988 gag rule, but the 1991 relaxed gag rule. The original 1988 gag rule had, however, been promulgated after following notice and comment procedures. The court seized upon this and wrote, It is a maxim of administrative law that if a second rule repudiates or is irreconcilable with a prior legislative rule, 
the second rule must be an amendment of the first. And of course, an amendment to a legislative rule must itself be legislative. So the relaxed gag rule had to issue from notice and comment because it amended a legislative rather than a merely interpretive rule. But the court did not address what would seem to be a crucial preliminary question. What makes the 1988 gag rule a legislative rather than an interpretive rule? Was it because the 1988 gag rule had been promulgated by notice and comment? That can't be enough. Agencies are free to devise their own procedures that involve more than what the APA requires. The court says, the agency was exercising its congressionally delegated authority to issue binding regulations to implement the statute and in so doing necessarily followed the required process of notice and comment rulemaking. This overlooks the fact that the agency also has congressionally delegated authority to interpret binding statutory provisions, and in so doing need not follow notice and comment procedures. The court continues. It is undisputed that the 1988 regulations were intended by HHS to be legislative rules governing the conduct of Title X grantors and grantees. So the agency conceded that the 1988 gag rule was legislative rather than merely interpretive. That was sufficient to make what the court says is often fuzzy into something clear, but we must ask, was this concession by HHS wise or unavoidable? If HHS was in 1988 was simply unpacking what it thought Title X already meant, it need not have gone through notice and comment even though it chose to anyway. Why would it have to keep using notice and comment to reinterpret an interpretive rule? That would hardly seem to count as the kind of totally unjustified departure from well-settled agency procedures of long standing that Vermont Yankees said might require judicial correction. What we need is an explanation of why the 1988 gag rule was legislative and not merely interpretive. The court intimates that the gag rule was legislative because it was a rule governing conduct. But in what sense was the conduct of the grantees governed? Weren't the grantees governed already by the statute? What did the gag rule do that the statute had not already done? So what makes a rule a legislative rule? We still need to know. The opinion takes several stabs at this, quoting other cases that say a legislative rule has a substantial impact. A substantial impact is one that has legal effects. And a rule has legal effects when, when it's not merely interpretive. Well, working from the other end, the court says a rule is merely interpretive when it only clarifies a statutory term or reminds parties of existing statutory duties or liabilities or merely tracks or simply explains what is already in the statute. We seem to be going in a circle. Query. Because the 1988 gag rule had a substantial impact, shouldn't it have to be promulgated by notice and comment even if it was interpretive? One way to break out of the circle would be simply to lay it down that any rule having a substantial impact has to go through notice and comment even if it is merely interpretive. This was the idea behind what was called the paralyzed veterans doctrine in the D.C. Circuit. If a reinterpretation of an interpretive rule has a substantial impact, it has to go through notice and comment. Makes sense, but the U.S. Supreme Court slapped down the paralyzed veterans idea in Perez versus mortgage bankers. The paralyzed veterans doctrine that notice and comment is required when an agency alters an interpretive rule with a new interpretive rule is contrary to the clear text of the APA's rulemaking provisions and it improperly imposes on agencies an obligation beyond the maximum procedural requirements specified in the APA under Vermont Yankee. This, of course, does nothing to clarify the distinction between legislative and interpretive rules. As the National Family Planning Court said at the outset of its opinion, the dividing line between legislative and interpretive rules has been deemed fuzzy in some cases, to which we might add, it could be deemed to be fuzzy 
in a lot of cases.